Great. Well, hello and good afternoon. Thank you so much to our EDC Utah investors and our friends for joining us today. I'm Teresa Foxley, the president and CEO of the Economic Development Corporation of Utah, and we are so thrilled to host you for what we expect will be an insightful and wide ranging conversation between two individuals that I respect and admire. First, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our special guest, Cheryl Sandberg. Cheryl serves as the Chief Operating Officer of Facebook, overseeing the firm's business operations. Prior to joining Facebook, Cheryl was the Vice President of Global Online Sales and Operations at Google and was the Chief of Staff for the United States Treasury Department. Cheryl is a renowned author, having written Lean In, Women, Work, and the Will to Lead, and having also co-authored Option B, Facing Adversity, Building Resilience, and Finding Joy. In addition to her service on various corporate boards, including Facebook and SurveyMonkey, Cheryl is an active philanthropist working to build a more equal and resilient world. Cheryl and her fiance live in Menlo Park, California with their five children. Cheryl, it truly is an honor and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, a great friend and partner to EDC Utah, Nubia Pena. Nubia currently serves as the director of the Utah Division of Multicultural Affairs, and she is also a senior advisor of equity and opportunity for Utah Governor Spencer J. Cox. Nubia has dedicated her career to bringing awareness to issues of anti-oppression and to building partnerships to advance diversity, equity, and belonging in the Beehive State. Nubia is a lawyer by training, and prior to joining the Division of Multicultural Affairs, she served as a juvenile defender. EDC Utah is so grateful for the partnership that we've developed with Nubia and for her willingness to lend her expertise to our growing emphasis on economic opportunity. Nubia, thank you for joining us today and for moderating this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so very much, Teresa. It is such a pleasure to join you and to, to serve in this capacity today. Well, thank you again, Nubia. It, it was really great to have you both here. We have so much to cover, uh, so I'm going to turn it, turn the time over to you and let you take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I do just want to stress and once again thank the team at EDC Utah for hosting and coordinating this event, as well as Facebook for being a strong partner in doing so. Um, I also want to recognize that it was a lot of logistics and a lot of <laughs> organizing that was required. And Cheryl, to you, Thank you for sharing space, for selecting Utah as a partner in your efforts, and for being willing to take the time to engage in conversation with us. Well, thank you all for having me. I, uh, I know when COVID happened, there were so many changes, and I, I know so much hardship. There was loss in my family. I hope there, I hope there wasn't loss in others, but I know there was. Um, and I really missed getting to travel to the places that Facebook calls home, including places like Utah, and getting to meet with businesses and our partners and clients. And then I started traveling virtually. And so while I'm not with you in person today, I am with you. I got to do a great small business roundtable with some amazing local businesses and I get to be with you here. And while it's not quite the same, I think it's much better than not doing this at all. And I'm just grateful for you to you for hosting this virtual visit. So thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much, Cheryl. And especially when you talk about loss and how the pandemic has just really shifted the way that we've needed to do things. That's going to be a great place for us to start in our conversation. And so, Cheryl, with this year and what it, it brought to us, there were so many companies that have done well during the pandemic, including the big tech companies. Meanwhile, there were others, especially small businesses that struggled. What role do you see big tech company playing in the recovery? So look, it's a really important question because COVID was not just a health crisis. It was an economic crisis and it is an economic crisis. I should use the present tense, not the past tense. And that includes for SMBs. We put out the Facebook small business report and 25% of SMBs in Utah reported that they reduced their number of employees because of the pandemic. And we obviously saw large numbers of small companies going out of business. Now, I can't speak for my whole industry, but I can speak for Facebook. And at Facebook, small businesses are the very heart of what we do. There are 200 million small businesses that use our free products. And so always in our work, but particularly this year, we asked ourselves what we could do to help. 
Now, the first thing we do is we provide online tools. Before the pandemic, a third of small businesses in the U.S. did not even have a website. No website. And that's because it's expensive. It's hard to build a website. And most small businesses aren't coders. I'm not a coder. I wouldn't know how to build a website, much less a mobile app. You can set up a Facebook page or an Instagram business profile in minutes, and it's free. And most people know how to do it because they are Facebook or Instagram users. And that's why there are 200 small, million small businesses using our tools. Now we provide digital school skills training. 100 million have tuned into Facebook virtual programs in the last year alone. But we also provided cash to keep the lights on. $100 million in, SA, 100 million in SMB grants to 30,000 small businesses in 30 countries, including 26 grants to small businesses in Utah. So I'm gonna share an example and it's my favorite example. I just met Nat and Nico Dico this morning in our small business round table. And this is so cool. They took a leap of faith when, they, when the pandemic hit and decided to quit their jobs and become COVIDpreneurs. So entrepreneurs during COVID, which is really brave. But they taught me something I had never thought about, which is the idea of urban farming. So they have 0 0.2 acres of land in Salt Lake City. And they started by making soaps and candles just to burn off their own stress. But now, and then hustling at outdoor farmers markets to sell their products. But then they started selling online and now they have these amazing gift boxes. And I ordered one. This is the best selling soap you've ever had in your life. It's the Lincoln Street Farm Hairberry Phil Greeby Soap. No, seriously, it is just absolutely amazing. And they were in my uh, Salt Lake City Instagram gift guide. But what they do is they use personalized ads on Instagram and they look for people nearby who are interested in home gardening, in home gardening. And they ask them to come to their stall at the farmer's markets. And nearly everyone who's coming into their stall says that they saw their ad on Instagram. And the reason I love this example is most small businesses don't do their business online. So no one can farm online, right? And they're not even selling online through us, but they are advertising online and bringing people to what is a really off, off, offline um, selling situation, which is a farmer's market. And, and they're doing it beautifully. It's pretty exciting. And they did it through a pandemic, which is even crazier. Oh, what an incredible success story, Cheryl. And thank you so much for sharing. And I do hope that folks are learning the names of these incredible small businesses that are thriving, especially in the time of difficulty. So thank you, Cheryl, for sharing that, especially when we're hearing about the shift to e-commerce and how the potential for people to be able to grow their businesses. That's exciting. And speaking of pivoting, I do want to talk a little bit about the ama amazing work that Facebook is doing that many people might not know about. So we talked about digital engagement and how we've had to now shift to live in a digital world. Well, when the pandemic hit, as people needed to work from home and schools needed to shift to online learning, the pandemic brought to light the significant digital inequities that exist for historically underserved commu communities and low income households. Many people are unaware that through the data centers that Facebook builds, you're actually helping people to bring high speed internet to communities that have not had access to broadband access. Can you talk a little bit about what Facebook is doing and how you've helped to address the digital divide? Yeah, we are very concerned with the digital divide because it's obviously really important. People don't realize that there's a digital divide in the US. People think of not, people not having internet access in other countries, that's not true, it's also true here. And it's really critical to people, especially during COVID, kids need high-speed internet to attract 10 virtual school. People need the internet to find jobs, see their doctors, connect with friends and family. Um, so in March, we completed a new long haul fiber line linking Facebook data centers in the East Coast all the way to the Indiana-Ohio border. And we're already building another fiber line that's gonna run from Indianapolis along Interstate 40 to the Illinois border. Now, these lines aren't just to improve connectivity between Facebook data centers, they improve broadband for homes and businesses in surround, the surrounding area. And we really care about that. We tend to build this kind of infrastructure in areas in the US that last lack that kind of capacity and while we do it, we expand broadband access to those in need. We've also had a very special program for tribal areas, giving, making sure tribes have connectivity 
And, and again, people don't realize this, in urban areas, in dense urban areas, it can be difficult to run fiber to every home. So we've worked with partners to develop fixed wireless access that performs similar to fiber. Carol, that is amazing. And again, I'm so grateful that you would think about your brand to not only talk about small and diverse businesses, but the way that you can give back, right? And the power of Facebook's brand is to do good and leave a lasting imprint for change and healing, which is, again, really meaningful, which leads to my next question. And this has um, really a complex answer, which I'm excited to hear from you. So on May 25th, we recently celebrated and unfortunately acknowledged the fact that so much has changed in the US and this was following the anniversary of George Floyd's murder. It's been a year since the racial reckoning has started and it has been deeply felt across the nation. We have seen significant change. We have seen significant commitments for ongoing transformation. What has Facebook done to invest and uplift black and multicultural businesses as well as the communities over the past year? So you're right, you know, you're talking about how we all just marked the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And it's obviously such a huge tragedy, um, but I do think it helped to create a greater consciousness of ongoing racial justice, injustice and inequality in the US. If you look at black owned businesses, they closed at two times the rate of other SMBs during COVID. And so we did another $100 million grant program to black owned businesses, creators and nonprofits. 40 million of that was for businesses, including five grants to black owned SMBs in Utah. But it wasn't just grants, it's obviously bigger than that. And we realized that millions of people really wanna help during this time. 3.5 million people on Facebook have joined new groups that are aimed at supporting black owned SMBs since COVID started. And one of my favorite programs we did is called Buy Black Friday. So I think everyone knows what Black Friday is. It's the Friday after Thanksgiving where people start their holiday shopping. We worked with the US Black Chambers to put out a gift guide of black owned businesses so that people could put their money where their mouth is and support those businesses. We're also very focused on training black and Latinx SMB owners. We've committed to reaching a million black and a million uh, Latinx people by 2023 through a program we call Facebook Elevate. So let me share one example of an amazing uh, black owned business. I had a chance this morning to uh, meet Amanda Messam. She left her job for five years at the start of the pandemic because she really wanted to be her own boss. And she's very passionate about flowers and flower pressing to turn bouquets and flower arrangements into something that's custom framed as art. Um, not the best time to start a business that depends on weddings, right? But she went online and she used social media and personalized ads to offer flowered pressing to brides, not just inside Utah, but outside Utah. And this was great. She used personal ads to reach people who are interested in wedding and flowers. And she also helped find people who changed their relationship status to engaged or to I'm getting married, which I think was very, very cool. But we know that black owned businesses, that other diverse, diverse businesses owned by diverse populations, they were hit harder in the pandemic. And that means it's on us to help them even more. Thank you so very much, Cheryl. And if people were interested in learning about the different businesses that you are all supporting, is there anywhere on your, on their, on your site that they can visit? Yeah, facebook.com slash business. Excellent. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And going right into that conversation about how businesses of color have been historically underserved and immensely and disproportionately affected by the pandemic, we also know that your role and your leadership has existed to elevate the story of women. And you've been a huge advocate through your foundation. So data suggests that women have also been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. There's something that's called the pink collar recession. So as someone who's been focused on this through your work, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in terms of the recovery so that women can engage and can thrive post pandemic? Yeah, so we talked before about how COVID was not just a health crisis, it was an economic crisis, but it's also a gender equality crisis, full on, you know, gender equality crisis. From February 2020 to February 2021, women lost 5.3 million jobs 
and 2.5 million women left the workforce, meaning they've stopped looking for work. And that compares to 1.8 million men. And as an example, in April of this year, so last month, 165,000 women left the workforce and 355,000 men joined it. So what does that mean? 56% of women are in the workforce and that is the lowest point since 1988. I really wanna say that again. We're at the lowest point of female workforce participation since 1988. Now my foundation, Lean In, was one of the first to do research. We put out research last fall saying that women were about to leave the workforce because of the pandemic. And it's not that women don't need these earnings for their family, they do. It's just that before coronavirus, we talked about women working a double shift. They worked at home, sorry, they worked in the office or they worked in jobs wherever they were. And then they came home and did most of the childcare and housework. And then it became a double, double shift, which is kids not in school, daycare center closed, elder care becoming more and more of a big deal. And so we know that kids need to, that sorry, that parents had too, had too much to do. Now, now if, uh, if you have a straight couple, both work in full time, the woman is doing 71 hours a week of childcare and housework, the man is doing 50. That means that woman is doing 21 hours a week more, which is half a full-time job. If you're a black mother, a Latina mother, it's even double, it's even larger than that. And so what do we need to do? We need to make sure we have the right public policies. We don't offer leave. We do not take care of people in this country as we should. We need to make sure we have the right corporate policies. At Facebook, we've been looking very carefully to make sure that we are not losing our women in greater numbers than men. And we are able to offer very extensive leave through coronavirus. And I think more companies need to have the long run view of saving their women now for the future. Cheryl, what an incredible call to action to corporations, to companies. I will say that with the administration, um, Governor Cox and Lieutenant uh, Governor Henderson are really committed to addressing this and discussing this. And what's exciting is to see the alignment with our corporations. So thank you, Cheryl, for what you're doing at Facebook. And again, inviting people to think about what are they going to do to make sure their policies support women in the workforce. So speaking of you being a leader, uh, let's talk a little bit about Silicon Valley um, and, and what your perceptions of Utah are as a tech center. What advice would you give to Utah business leaders on how to continue to stay competitive in our evolving economy? Well, look, we think Utah is a growing tech center and we're really glad to have a presence here. We're building our data center in Eagle Mountain and we have a small engineering office in Park City. So why is Utah attractive? High skill talent, very attractive place for people to live and work. And that is increasingly not true in some other cities where, where we are in very good infrastructure. And so the advice I'd give, and also a diverse workforce and an increasingly diverse workforce. So the advice I'd give is the same advice I'd give to any, any city working on this is education, great planning, so people have great, have great places to live and great infrastructure. And I think Utah is doing all of that. Mm. Cheryl, excellent. And thank you, because we do want to celebrate Utah. We want to celebrate what we're doing right and how we can attract other corporations. But again, knowing that Facebook has selected us, it really means so much. And so we're hoping that you can continue to share the story of our partnership and how much this is a great place to bring your employees to. So thank you so much. Now we do want to be mindful and we want to reserve some Q&A time for our audience. Um, but I, before I pass the time over to Teresa, Cheryl, you started off the conversation with mentioning loss. And this is a little bit of a pivot, but I wanted to invite us to engage through vulnerability with you because you've done so much, you've carried so much, and you're still leading out. So this year has been incredibly difficult for people, but for some most, um, for, for some more so than others, particularly when they've lost loved ones. And after your husband passed away, you wrote about the challenges that you faced, but how were you able to ultimately rebuild resilience and find joy again? Can you talk about that experience and potentially give advice to anyone who might be struggling right now? So I think it's a beautiful question, Nubia, thank you. And, and it's a question that goes to where we all are. 
I did lose my husband suddenly a little over six years ago. And there was a father-son activity that he was supposed to do with my then 10-year-old son. And I was talking to my friend, Phil, and I said, we were coming up with other ideas of who could go with our, my son to this activity, his uncles, Phil, et cetera. And I looked at Phil and I said, but I want Dave, my husband, like, I want Dave. And Phil said, option A is not available. So we're going to kick the fill in the blank out of option B. And I think I have lived in option B. And I think everyone is living in option B right now, whether it's loss or fear or lost wages, you know, through a coronavirus pandemic that none of us expected. We're all living in option B. Uh, when I lost Dave, I said uh, to my friend Adam, who's a psychologist, how do I know how much resilience I have? And he said that was exactly the wrong question. Resilience is not something you're born with a certain amount. It's a muscle and we build it and we build it in ourselves and we build it in each other. And I think the way we build it is knowing that the hard times, the worst moments in our life, they actually do make us stronger. And if we pay attention, they can make us more joyful. And when I say this newbie, I want to be really clear and careful. I would give away the lessons I learned to have my husband back and a father for my children. But I don't have that choice. But on the other side, there are things about my life that are not just recovered, but that are better. And I'll give you an example. Birthdays. I used to make the jokes everyone makes. I'm growing old. I used to not celebrate my birthdays except the zero and fives. But losing a husband at age 47, I realized, oh my God, you either grow older or you don't. I celebrate every birthday now. Every birthday. I would never make a joke about growing old, ever. And I appreciate like the opportunity to grow old in a way I didn't. That, that is the joy. More, there is more joy every day for me in some ways because I appreciate things in a way I didn't before. I'll give you an example from coronavirus, right? I wish we were there and we could ask the audience. And I think it's changed now. But if you had said six months ago, when was the last time you had hugged a friend? I didn't appreciate hugging a friend before this. Maybe you did, but I didn't. I, I always hugged my friends. The first time, and it was quite recently after I was lucky enough to get vaccinated and California opened up, I hugged a friend. I was like, oh my God, I'm hugging a friend appreciated it in a whole new way. Cheryl, I can't thank you enough for the vulnerability in that response. Um, I didn't know it was going to touch me so hard, but you're right. We, we have to just hold on to those moments, find gratitude, and recognize that every single moment counts. And so Cheryl, right. thank you so much for, for being willing to open up to our audience today, um, not only as it relates to the tech business and how you are leading out this fierce corporation, but also how you're healing and how you're, you're, you're moving forward for your family, your children, and you're leading out as an example to many of us. So thank you, Cheryl, for that. So I want to be mindful that our audience wants to engage with yes. Cheryl and ask a couple of questions. And so in order for us to transition to the Q&A, I would invite our fierce leader, Teresa, at EDC <laughs> to navigate this part of the conversation. Well, thank you so much, Nubia. As always, you are an absolutely terrific presence, and we appreciate you moderating this discussion which uh, like you really touched me. I'm, I'm actually quite bowled over by, uh, by the vulnerability that you've displayed, Cheryl, and, and thank you for that. And thank you for your authenticity, uh, for being so candid, for sharing some inspiring stories of these amazing small businesses that you met with earlier today, uh, and for a great reminder to practice daily gratitude. So thank you. Um, I am very excited to be able to turn our attention to a few questions that have been submitted by our audience. Uh, and I would invite you to put in any additional questions into the Q&A, which should be open in the Zoom feature right now. Uh, but for those, uh, we have a, a couple that were submitted at the time of registration. I want to turn to one that was submitted by Beth Colosimo with Salt Lake Community College's Small Business Resource Center and the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. Beth, thanks for submitting the question, uh, which is, with so many changes to digital media platforms, changing algorithms, and new mediums, Cheryl, how would you suggest that small businesses manage digital marketing in the most effective manner while also trying to keep their company 
companies running and doing what they're expert at, which may be pressing flowers or maybe mm -hmm. uh, urban farming or something else entirely? Well, I think small businesses are like people on our products, which is you want to be authentic. People want to see the stories. They want to see the people behind the business. They don't want to just see a business. They want to understand who you are. And so the same way you share authentically, you share authentically about your business. It's also important not to be afraid to try new tools and features. Try Facebook groups, try going live, even if it's just a few minutes, you know, that experience. It's also worth learning from others. I mean, I learn from people whose posts I really like. There's things I want to do differently on social media. Same thing for businesses. Um, and I'm going to share a local example. I had a, another opportunity this morning to meet Brent Uberty, who runs BW Productions, which is a video production company. And what they do is they make business, they have, their business is making videos for clients. Now, when COVID hit, they didn't really have more business. But as he said, he was, uh, had one employee himself. And so... He wanted to survive, but he also knew he needed to do it in a remote world. He took it upon himself to learn how to use the digital tools on Facebook and Instagram to help other business owners create content for social media to promote their products during the pandemic. And he started helping clients understand how to use Facebook and Instagram lives and virtual events. And so perfect example of someone doing things online who never had before. You know, there's that saying, don't waste a crisis. I think what, the, what COVID did was accelerate that move to online. And I think as businesses are opening up, a lot of businesses are gonna try to hang on to their online business as they go back to in-person and therefore grow. That's pretty exciting. Indeed, really exciting. And I love hearing stories of small businesses helping other small businesses by using what they're expert in. So thanks for sharing, Cheryl. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, corporate responsibility and creating cultures of inclusivity and workforce uh, policies that advance and retain women. Um, and we had a great question that came in from Barb Johnson with CBRE, and that was, how has a diverse workforce made Facebook a better company? So I was wondering, Cheryl, if you could share a little bit more about how Facebook thinks about talent uh, with, within the company and, and how um, that impacts performance for your organization? Diversity has to be part of what we do, not just because it's the right thing to do, and it is, and that's important. It's also the smart thing to do. Diverse teams put out better products are more successful. You know, we build products for the whole world. We need to do that using diverse talent. Our chief diversity officer at Facebook is Maxine Williams, someone I've just learned so much from over so many years of working together. And she says all the time that it's not enough to hire diversity, you have to harness the power of diversity. So if you hire people with diverse backgrounds, but then you have a culture where no one can speak out using their diverse backgrounds, you don't get the benefit. So what do we try to do? We try to hire a diverse workforce. We're doing better, but we have a long way to go. But then we really try to build a culture that harnesses that diversity. We do uh, bias training for everyone so people can recognize aggressions and microaggressions. We make sure that we put diversity at the center of what we do. And the result is that are better for our business. Now, one of the um, things I mentioned before, I said was one of my favorite programs we ever ran by Black Friday. Well, that never would have happened without our diverse workforce. Remy and Rachel are two black employees that came up with the idea after Facebook help, help, held open forums after the murder of George Floyd. We had open forums where we could all come together and discuss those forums were open to everyone. They came, they came up with Buy Black Friday. And that's a perfect example of not just hiring amazing people in, but harnessing the power of diversity to come up with the ideas we need. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That's a great reminder to leaders of organizations, and I see several that are participating in today's call to, to um, acknowledge the different voices that they have within their organizations and, and listen to them and what an advancement that can be within their organizations. Um, but a lot of great questions that are coming through in the chat. I want to take one um, from Michael Parker here with Ivory Homes, and thanks, Michael, for submitting the question. Uh, this is one related to remote work. 
Uh, and a question related to um, this massive shift that we've all undertaken over the last year uh, with work from anywhere, work from home, uh, being part of our daily vernacular. Uh, how has this changed your site selection criteria? I think this will be interesting to, to EDC Utah investors. Um, so if you're looking at new additional offices, uh, what, is that, what does that look like now as, um, as we have incorporated uh, this flexibility into our, into our lives and into our companies? So as we look for remote offices or places to do data centers, we look, as I said before, for great places to work places where we can hire, places where we can grow. Our Eagle Mountain data center, you know, will create 1,250 construction jobs at its peak, uh, 200 jobs in an ongoing way, and it's a billion dollars of investment. So we got to do that in a place that is very welcoming to business and can give us, and can give us the things we need. Um, and that's been really, really important. And as I said before, we try to give back to the local community. We do lots of programs and support lots of nonprofits, work on infrastructure, work very hard on renewable energy. And that's how we really do site selection. And then there's the question of remote work, which is about working from anywhere. So I'm in my house in Menlo Park. Teresa, where are you? I'm in my office in downtown Salt Lake, but I've spent a lot of days in my basement over the last year. Yeah, and we're not on a stage together. And I, I wish I could ask the audience, where are you? If you had asked me, or if you had told me a year and a quarter ago, we're gonna send all your employees home overnight, including tens of thousands of contractors who don't even have computers. And we're going to keep the site up, keep it running, to keep protecting our community, getting bad stuff off Facebook, keep shipping products. I would have told you you were crazy. In fact, people had talked to me about remote work and I was not the biggest fan. But it turns out that you and I can have a great conversation remote, remotely. And Facebook, we were able to build products and not just keep the lights on, but keep our business growing and keep supporting all these amazing small businesses you and I have been talking about. And so that means you can work from anywhere. Now, how are we gonna do that when it goes back? Goes back? We're not 100% sure. We're talking to our employees, they want flexibility, we wanna give that to them, but we also wanna make sure that we keep building a culture where we can work together. And so we are thinking it through, but what I do know is there is more remote work going on and will be towards the future. Thanks, Cheryl, for, for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, we have another great question in the chat from Kim Frost with Utah, the Utah Clean Air Partnership. Uh, and it relates to, uh, to a couple of questions that I wanted to ask and also draw on one from Beth Holbrook with the Utah Transit Authority, but it's this, Utah has a strong entrepreneurial spirit as well as a culture of giving. We have a number of nonprofits in the state that have felt the impact of the pandemic. And the question is, can you share any ex examples of nonprofits that have used social media and specifically Facebook to continue to grow their organizations over the last year? I wonder if you can answer that question with a lens both towards nonprofits, but also towards how public sector entities can communicate with their stakeholders as well. Yeah, absolutely. All the tools that are available to people and small businesses are available and broadly used by nonprofits. We've announced that people on Facebook have raised $5 billion for nonprofits. Now, that's a big number, but that is really small individual fundraisers. I'll share one of my favorite examples. You asked for an example. A few years ago for International Women's Day, I did a round table with some women who had supported nonprofits. And one of those women, she said she volunteered for a local uh, domestic violence shelter in her hometown. And for her birthday, she did a Facebook birthday fundraiser. And as she said, it takes $1,500, so $1,500 to save a woman and her children from an abusive situation. And she did her birthday fundraiser hoping she would raise, save one woman. Well, she raised more, about $5,000. She saved, as she said, at three and a quarter families. But more importantly, she said her friends realized she was involved in this shelter and they started doing birthday fundraisers and they started volunteering. And so we see public sector groups, including groups in Utah, nonprofits using the power of Facebook. And they do it the same way people do it and the same way businesses do it. They set up pages and profiles, they put out their story, and then they engage people in the mission of their work. And that is super important to us. I love hearing that. And I, I love this uh, new focus that I'm seeing as I am on social media as well. 
uh, as as people want to celebrate, but they want to they want to do good through these celebrations, and and that's terrific. So thank you, Cheryl, uh, for sharing that example. Um, we just all uh, recognized and acknowledged uh, Memorial Day weekend, and we are so grateful for the service of our military veterans and and for uh, what that means for platforms like Facebook that allow us to engage in in conversations and important conversations. Uh, and, and I've got a question here from uh, Adrian Week or Weik. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, but I am a veteran and a military spouse, retired. With COVID forcing a number of women out of the workforce and military spouses sitting at over 30% unemployment, do you have any ideas on how to engage this uh, important uh, part of our community, Cheryl? I do. I mean, it's something I really care about with my Facebook hat on, my personal hat on, but also with my lean in hat on that, um, there are such important communities. Military spouses has always been a challenge for jobs because you move so often as a military spouse and you often don't have control about when those movements are. And I've met so many women when I visited bases or in my, in my travels who are military spouses who have used Facebook and Instagram um, to, set up, to set up communities and jobs. One of them, there was a military spouse who started uh, helping people do virtual birthday parties for little girls that her little daughter had, her daughter, sorry, little daughter, her daughter, who was obviously little, had moved over the years. And so she wanted to keep in touch with her friends. So she, this before COVID, started helping them do virtual birthday parties. And it was a business that was helping to support her family. Uh, and well, thank you again, Cheryl, for sh for sharing some of those examples. And I do hope that this shift to remote work can enable and unlock this really important military spouse constituency, uh, as um, as they are so mobile. So thank you. Um, you mentioned something earlier about uh, about when you're thinking about site selection criteria. Uh, you mentioned things like infrastructure and quality of life, but you also mentioned uh, Facebook's emphasis on sustainability and have had a couple of folks reach out to me by text to ask about that. So I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more about um, how Facebook thinks about sustainability and how uh, the company has invested in sustainability measures here in the state of Utah. Yeah, we really care a lot about this. I know that everyone does. As of 2020, our global operations are supported by 100% renewable energy. And that really matters. And we think about it kind of from the ground up. We think about it from design and construction to energy sources and water stewardship and responsibly managing the end of the life of our equipment. We're also investing a lot of renewable energy in Utah and across the U.S., we have eight solar products in Utah, and the additional solar capacity Facebook is adding is equal to 63% of the solar energy currently produced in the state. And I'm really proud of that. And Facebook and Rocky Mountain Power, we've partnered to develop a renewal of energy rate in the state, which is available to all qualifying customers. So when we go in and do something for our own data centers and for our own, our own use, we work hard with local partners to make it available to people in the area too. And our local partners are always, um, are always very supportive of that. We're also very uh, focused on water stewardship. Um, our data centers are amongst the most efficient in the world. We are 80% more water efficient than the average. And our Eagle Mountain data center is recycling millions of gallons of water back to the community for reuse. We've partnered with the Central Utah Water Conservancy District um, and we have 2 million cubic meters of water remaining in the Olmstead reach of the Provo River, which has been chronically dewatered in the summer months. So working hard with local partners to help locally. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl. It's been really cool to have a front row seat to some of those uh, investments that, that Facebook has been making in sustainability in our community. And we're incredibly grateful for that. Um, I have one last question from a good friend of mine, Vicki Varela, um, and, and then I think we'll wrap up from there, but that is uh, turning it back to a little bit more personal. And again, I've appreciated your vulnerability through this conversation and, and in other forums where I've seen you speak, but that is, um, what is the most important thing that your parents did to create a foundation for your success? Mm -hmm. You know, my parents told me that I, if I worked hard, I could do anything. I had a sister and a brother, they never treated us differently. They never said girls can't or boys should. Um, 
you know, um, and they told me that it was about working hard. And I try to tell my kids that, and now this is, has all, this is all the growth mindset stuff that has names and, uh, you know, theories to it. But I think it really is what my parents did, which is they said, you know, just keep working hard, just keep trying hard. If you don't learn it this time, you'll learn it the next time opportunity for growth. Awesome. Well, thanks, Cheryl. That's great advice to uh, to not only those of us who are who are bringing up little ones, but to everyone, I think, in this conversation. So thank you. Thank um, you. I do want you to know, as we wrap up, we've had a couple of tremendous uh, business people and entrepreneurs and individuals who I admire have wanted uh, to say a note of thanks to you. Uh, both Darlene uh, with Terracon, uh, who said that she was uh, she'd use Facebook to help grow her business when she was a consultant. Uh, and that allowed her to spend some time with her young child uh, as a mom. And uh, Anna Valdemaros, who is a Salt Lake City Council member, but who also is an incredible entrepreneur, and who's helped elevate other entrepreneurs through uh, through her kitchen uh, in, in Salt Lake City, but she says that she uses Facebook and Insta for all of her businesses, including politics and personal use. Uh, so it really is tremendous what this platform has done uh, to help connect the world, uh, to help connect small businesses to those of us who, who are um, in the marketplace, uh, and really to allow us to, to celebrate and to, um, to enjoy each other's company. I, certainly, I found social media to be even that much more important over this last year as connecting in person was harder and harder. So I do wanna say thank you uh, on behalf of EDC Utah. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the investments that you have made in, in Utah. Thank you for this conversation. Uh, and a big thanks as well to our wonderful moderator, Nubia Pena. You are absolutely phenomenal. Thanks to your team, Cheryl. They were terrific to work with and I uh, would be very remiss if I didn't thank the EDC Utah team of Mike O'Malley, Elizabeth Johnson, Stephanie Froman, and our partner, William Marks with Facebook. Uh, and of course, I would not be doing my job as a, as a booster for Utah if I didn't also say go jazz. Uh, game five tonight. <laughs> let's uh, let's bring home the win tonight, uh, Jazz. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Nubia. Thank you, Teresa. It was a pleasure. Thank you all. Take care.